Hatchet, chapter 18. Brian worked around the tail of the plane two more times, pulling himself on the stabilizer and the elevator. But there simply wasn't a way in. Stupid, he thought. I wasn't, I was stupid to think I could just come out here and get inside the plane. Nothing that easy. Nothing out here. Not in this place. Nothing is easy. He slammed his fist against the body of the plane to complete and to his complete surprise, the aluminum covering gave, easy, uh, gave easily under the blow. He hit it again, and once again, once more, it bent and gave, and found. And he found that even when he didn't strike it, he just pushed it. It moved. It still moved, but it was real. But <laughs> it moved. It was really, he thought, very thin aluminum skin over the kind of skeleton and gave easily. He might be able to force his way through. The hatchet. He might be able to cut it or hack it with the hatchet. He realized he reached under his belt and pulled the hatchet out. Pulled, picked a place where the aluminum gave to his push and took the experimental swing at it. The hatchet cut through the aluminum as if it were soft cheese. He couldn't believe it. Three more hacks, and, this, and he had a triangular hole the size of his hand and could see four cables that he guessed were the control cables going back to the tail. And he hit the skin of the plane with a frenzied series of hacks to make still larger openings. Um, and he was bending the piece of aluminum his way with two aluminum braces and some, uh, of some kind when he dropped the hatchet. He went straight down past his legs. He felt the bump of his foot and then go down, down into the water. And for a second, he couldn't understand that he had done it. For all this time, all the living and fighting, the hatchet had been everything. He had always worn it. Without the hatchet, he was nothing. No fire, no tools, no weapons. He was nothing. The hatchet was and had been him. And he had dropped it. Ah, he yelled, choked on it snarling rage at his own carelessness. The hole in the plane was still too small to be used for anything, and now he didn't have his tool. That was the kind of thing I would have done before, he uh, said to the light, to the sky, to the trees. When I came here, I would have done that. Not now. Not now. Yet he had, and he hung on to the raft for a moment, felt sorry for himself, for his own stupidity. But before that, self, the self-pity didn't help and he knew that and he only had one course of action he had to get the hatchet back he had to dive and get it back but how deep was it at the end of the gym a pool at school he had no trouble getting to the bottom and he was pretty sure and he was pretty sure about 11 feet here it was impossible to know the exact depth at the end of the plane anchored by his weight at the engine was obviously at the bottom but had come back at the angle so the water wasn't as deep as the plane was long. He pulled himself out of the water so his chest could expand and took two deep breaths, sh uh, swiveled and dove, putting his arms, pulling his arms and kicking off the raft bottom with his feet. He first then thrust down a good eight feet, but the visibility was only five feet beyond that and he could not see the bottom yet. He clawed down six or seven more feet, the pressure pushing in his ears until his nose popped, and then just as just as he was ran out of breath, he's headed and headed back up. He saw the bottom, still four feet, um, still four feet below his dive. He exploded out to the surface, bumping his head on the side of the elevator, which had come up and took the play took air as if he was a whale pushing the stale air out until he wheezed and taking new in he would have to get deeper yet and still have time to search while he was down there stupid he thought once more cursing himself just dumb he pulled air again and and again pushing his chest until he could not possibly get any more capacity and then took one deep lungful and wheeled and dove again this time he made an arrow out of his arms and legs to push the bottom of the raft and pushed off the bottom of the raft. All he 
had in his legs to spring snap and propel him down. As soon as he felt himself slowing down a bit, he started raking back with his arms and his sides, like the paddles thrusting uh, with his legs like a frog, and this time he was successful, and he ran his face in the bottom of the mug. He shook his head clear in his eyes and looked around. The plane had disappeared out of out and down in front of him. He thought he could see the windows that made him think again about the pilot sitting inside, and he forced his thoughts from it. He was here, to, he, uh, but he could see no hatchet. Bad air triggers were starting to go off in his brain, and he, started, he knew he had limited seconds to go now, but he held for a moment and tried moving out a bit until he ran out of air knew what he was going to have to do to he knew he was going to have to blow soon he saw the handle sticking out of the mud he made one grab missed it reached again and felt his fingers close to the rubber he clutched it and in one motion slammed his feet down into the mud and powered himself up but now his lungs were ready to explode and he had flashes of colors in his brain explosions of colors and he would have and he would have to pull a, he would have to take a pull of water, take it into his lungs, just as he opened his mouth to take in, to pull in the water in his leg, in the lake, he blew out uh, of the surface and into the light. Chalk! It was just chalk. It was as if a balloon had exploded. Old air came out of his nose and mouth, and he pulled in and again and again. He reached for the side of the raft, hung there, just breathing until he could once more, until he could think once more. The hatchet clutched, shiny in his right hand. All right, the plane, still the plane. He went back to the hole in, uh, in the fuselage and began to chop and cut again, peeling the aluminum skin off in pieces. It was slow going because he was careful, very careful with the hatchet, but... He, but, he, uh, but he hacked and pulled until the opening, until he'd opened a large hole, and a, a large hole enough to pull his, his head and shoulders in and look down into the water. It was very dark inside the fuselage, and he could see nothing, no signs of the survival pack. There were some small pieces of bits of paper floating on the surface inside the plane, dirt from the floor and the plane that had floated up, but nothing substantial. Well, he thought... Did I just, did I expect it to be easy? So easy this way? Just open her up and get the pack, right? He would have to open up more, more, much more. So he could poke down inside and see what he could find. The survival pack had been a zippered nylon bag and perhaps, or perhaps canvas of some kind, he thought. It had been red, or was it gray? Well, it didn't matter. Uh, it wouldn't have moved, it must have moved when the plane crashed and it might be jammed down in something else. Started chopping again, cutting the aluminum away in small triangles, putting each one on the raft as he chopped. He could never throw anything away again, he thought, because it might be useful later. Bits of metal, fish air, uh, arrowheads, or lures, maybe. And he might finally finished, uh, and when he was finally finished, again, he had cleaned the whole side and top of the fuselage and uh, stuck out of the water. The, it had cut down into the water as far as it could be reached and had a hole almost as big as he was, except it was crossed and crisscrossed with aluminum, or it might be steel. He couldn't tell. Braces and formers of the cables. It was awful tangled mess, but chopping some of the braces away, there was room to wiggle uh, through to get, him, get wiggle through and get inside. He held back for a moment, uncomfortable with the thought of getting inside the plane. What if the tail settled back to the bottom and he got caught and couldn't get out? It was a horrible thought, but then he reconsidered. The thing had been up for two days now, plus a bit, and he had been hammering, climbing on it, and had gone back down. It seemed pretty solid. He eeled through it, he eeled through the cables and formers, wiggling and pulling until he was inside the tail with his head clear on the surface of the water and his legs down the angled floor. When he was ready, he took a deep breath and pushed down the water with his legs, feeling for some kind of fabric or cloth, anything with his bare feet. He touched nothing but the floor plates. Up and 
a new breath, then reached down the former's underwater and pulled himself beneath the water, his legs pushing down and down, almost to the back of the front, uh, almost to the backs of the front seats. And finally, on the left side of the plane, he thought he felt his foot. He thought he felt his foot hit cloth or canvas. Up for more air, deep breathing, then. One more grab at the formers and pushing as hard as he could be uh, jammed his feet down and hit again. Definitely canvas or heavy nylon. Uh, and this time when he pushed his foot through, he felt something inside it, something hard. It had to be the bag. Driven forward by the crash, he, it was jammed into the backs of the seats and caught on something. He tried to reach for it and pull it but didn't have enough air left and went up for more. Lungs filled with great gulps, he shot down again, pulling the farmers until he was almost there, then wheeling down at first his head. Uh, at first, he grabbed at the cloth. It was a survival bag. He pulled and tore at the torret to loosen it, and just before it broke free and his heart leaped, as, uh, and he pulled and tore, uh, at it to loosen it and just as it broke free and his heart leaped to feel the rise as it looked up above the bag in the light coming through the side window the pale green light from the window he saw the pilot's head uh, only it wasn't the pilot's head anymore the fish he never really thought about it but the fish had been eating all this time and had eat too they had the pilot all the time, almost two months, nabbing and chewing at all that remained at the uh, not quite clean skull. Um, not quite clean skull, and when he looked, it wobbled loosely. Too much, too much. His mind screamed in horror, and he slammed back, and he was sick in the water. So sick that he choked on it and tried to breathe water and could have ended, uh, and could have ended there. Ended with the pilot, where... It um, ended with the pilot where it almost ended and where they first arrived, except that is the except that his legs jerked. It was instinctive. Fear more than anything else. Fear from what he'd seen. But he jerked and pulled and was headed up when he jerked and shot to the surface, still inside the birdcage of the formers and cables. His head slammed into a bracket as he cleared and he reached up to grab it and it was free in the air hanging up on the tail he hung at that he hung that way for several minutes choking and has fully grasping for air inside uh, and gasping for air fighting to clear the picture the pilot from his mind it went slowly he knew it would never completely leave but he looked to the shore and there were trees and birds the sun was getting low and golden over the shelter and he'd stop coughing and when he stopped coughing he could hear the gentle sounds of the evening peace sounds the bird sounds and the breeze the peace finally came to him and he settled on his breathing he was still a long way from being finished he had work to do the bag was floating next to him but he had to get it to the get it out of the plane and onto the raft and back to the shore he wriggled through the formers it seemed harder than when he came in and pulled the raft around the bag fought him, almost as if it didn't want to leave the plane. He pulled and jerked, and still it wouldn't fit. Um, still it wouldn't fit, and at last he changed. And at last he had to change the shape of it, rearranging what was inside, pushing it in the size until he narrowed it and made it longer. Even when it finally came, it was difficult, and he had to pull it from one side, then another, an inch at a time, squeezing it through. All of this took some time, and when he was finally got the bag and tied and tied on top of the raft and it was nearly dark he was bone tired from working in the water all day chilled deeply but he still had to push the raft ashore many times he thought he would not make it with the added weight of the bag which seemed to get heavier by the foot coupled with the fact that he was getting weaker all the time the raft seemed to barely move he kicked and pulled and pushed taking the shortest way back to the shore and hang having hanging it to rest many times, then surging again. It seemed to take forever, and when at last his feet hit bottom and he could push against the mud and slide the raft onto the shore to bump the bank, he was so weak he couldn't stand. He had to crawl. 
He tried so tired that he didn't even notice the mosquitoes that tore at him like a gray, angry cloud. He had done it. Uh, that's all he could think now. He had done it. He turned and sat on the bank with his legs in the water and pushed the bag ashore and began a long drag. He couldn't lift back to the uh, shoreline of the shelter. Two hours, almost three, dragged and stumbled in the dark, brushing the mosquitoes away, sometimes on his feet, more often on his knees. Finally, to drop the bag to sleep, and he made, and when he made it, the sand in front of the doorway. He had done it.